The Japan Foundation Manila presents Virtual Book Launching of Art Archive 3 Collection of Essays on Philippine Contemporary Music and Design A message from the director of the Japan Foundation Manila Greeting from the Japan Foundation Manila I'm happy to welcome you all to the Virtual Book Launching of Art Archive 3 This third volume of the Art Archive series explores the current trends and concerns in the Philippine contemporary music and design. Both genres have been drawing much attention locally and globally, but there is little publication to give an outline of the current states and interpret their background for the global readers. Featuring 16 esteemed contributors writing about their fields of expertise, we hope this publication will serve as a resource for our readers thereby contributing constant, constructively to the international dialogue and promotion of contemporary art in the Philippines. Art Archive 3 and the rest of the volumes are published in digital format for accessibility and distribution. You can download them for free on our official website. I'd like to give many thanks to everyone behind this publication. Our editors, Professor Jose Buen Conce Consejo, of music section and architect uh, Gary Torres and Leonido Kines Jr. for design section. All the contributors and our editorial team, this would have not been possible without everyone's time and effort. This year has not been easy for most of us. Amid the challenges, we believe the international collaboration has much more importance in opening avenues to find innovative ways to solve the adverse cities we are facing. Our unity is our strength. Madame Salama, thank you very much for your attention. Content introduction from the section editor. In behalf of the six authors in this volume, we are happy to present our current research on contemporary Philippine music. And indeed, we are honored by and grateful to the J Japan Foundation Manila office for recognizing our research endeavors and for the support in disseminating these researches in print. The general idea of the music section was to present a diverse selection of topics of contemporary Philippine music and dance. By doing so, we were guided by the thought of social inclusion and of advocating for multicultural pluralism. To actualize social inclusion, does not mean creating borders once more by repeating the same mistake of excluding others. One can see this principle in reading closely the contents of this issue in which art and the popular bleed with each other fluidly, the highbrow and lowbrow cultures bedded in the same space of discourse. There are seven essays on music in this volume, but it was simply, of course, for practical reasons that we were not able to tackle Philippine jazz or countercultural rock music. The first essay is entitled Recontextualizing OPM in the 21st Century by Assistant Professor Krina Kayabiab of UP College of Music. She writes the differences between music production and dissemination in the past and in the present of OPM or original Filipino music. In the past, music production was mainly concentrated and produced by major commercial recording companies. Today, what we have are independent musicians who form collectives, and this is a context for producing and disseminating the research through Spotify and other online streaming uh, platforms. After OPM, we go to sound art. So the second essay is by Professor Agnes Manalo, who teaches at La Salle University College of St. Benil, and her essay is titled Beyond Music and Sound Art. Sound art is experimental music in the realm of the popular. And it's something that converges different uh, art forms like visual arts and recently film, and they call it sound design. So sound art is not really the previous, quite different from OPM, which is made up, uh, which is produced by uh, professional musicians. Sound art are produced by 
academically inclined uh, listeners. So there are, there are four practitioners of that art and uh, Professor Manalo will discuss it later. And then the third essay is Varieties of Contemporary Filipino Song Mashups. Now, this was written by me as, as an editor. I shouldn't have joined the, in the writing process, but I thought no one would really care to write about this topic, you know, because this is grassroots music making and really a musical world made up of musical amateurs. So with the gadgets available, they created song medleys and they, and they, and they uploaded this in YouTube and somehow they get visibility and, you know, this music sort of make them happy. The fourth essay is written by Dr. Lara Mendoza and she entitles this, this essay, Pinoys and Battle Rap. Now this is a street art form like graffiti and battle rap is the most viewed battle rap in the whole world. And there, uh, it gives them a lot, great pride, you know, to have this uh, global visibility. But the practitioners of this art are really ordinary people, people from the working class, well, including other social classes. The fifth is by Eileen de la Cruz, at, and it's entitled Situating Music in the Context of Recent Trends in Original Philippine Musical Theater Productions. There are three types of musical theaters in this essay. The first type is the more common one. They call it, of course, we know it. We're familiar with Rock of Ages, which is a jukebox musical. The second type is concept theater. And there were two that were pointed out by Eileen. And these were Putri Anak by uh, Dr. Vern de la Pena and Mabining Mandirigma, directed by Nicanor Chongson to the music of Joe Ed Balsamo. And then the last one, she discussed Ang Larawan, which was a film musical adaptation with music by Ryan Kayabiab. So that one is more familiar. We, we've tried to include not only music, but also in relation to other media. So theater is multimedia. The, the sixth essay is by Professor Tusa Montes, who teaches at UP College of Music. And the title of her essay is Music Festivals in the Philippines, Tropicality, Identity, and Cosmopolitanism. Now, these festivals are quite different from the folk festivals that we're familiar with during fiestas, nor the festivals that are initiated by local governments. These are music festivals initiated by private entities with an entrepreneurial spirit to promote tourism. So festivals that Professor Tusa will be talking about is the more recent variety. It is afforded by travel and there's, an, there's a move towards promoting a place, depicting it as a tropical place, you know. Uh, and this is, this, according to um, Professor Montes, creates some kind of a cosmopolitanism, which is a good value in the age of travel. Because if you are not a cosmopolitan, one cannot really respect another, other differences, you know, cultural differences. And then the last essay is Powerful Move, The Influence of Budot's Dance in Philippine Society by Professor Desiree Peralejo, who teaches ballet in the UP College of Music. Budot's is, it originated from the Bajau groups in Davao City, but has been visible through the social media. And then there were two uses, you know, by which Budot's was, had an impact, one of course, was the, the use of this in uh, gaining electoral votes. Ms. Peralejo talks about there was a value connected to that so that people were able to give their consent, you know, that this is a good leader because he is one of us. And then there was also another appropriation or use of budots, but this time in the concert stage by Earl Sorilia. And Earl Sorilia made some kind of a political statement. So this last essay is an interesting one because you know, even if art is just an expression, it cannot really be separated from the context. And here we have political context. So with that, I hope everyone will enjoy our, our project and read uh, this volume. Thank you. Contributors of the music section. Good day, everyone. My name is Karina Hayabiab, and I am here to present to you Recontextualizing OPM in 21st Century. How do we define and locate original Filipino music in the 21st century? 
Does it have the same use as being a marketing strategy, at the same time being a marker of Filipino identity back when it was first used in 1976? Is it only meaningful for various local genres that became hits from that decade on, even until the 90s? Is the term relevant to still be used from the 2000s onwards? If yes, how is OPM recontextualized within new technologies, new media, new practices of various music scenes, and new cultural policies, to name a few links that are at play? It seems that OPM remains in the effective struggle to be positioned in the everyday. Its looming presence has brought about movements and dialogue for its sustainability and relevance or irrelevance in society. Various events, media, and scenes continue to empower and are empowered by the idea of OPM. In this article, I look into how OPM becomes effervescent in three examples of music scenes. First, is through indie and mainstream practices and meanings that intersect through digital media. In this case, Filipino artists are not highlighted as OPM makers, but rather as movers of local music industries that operate around overlapping ideas of mainstream and independent music making. Second, is how musical theater has promoted the heritage of those considered as OPM hits from the past decades. Jukebox musicals such as Rack of Eejis, Ang Huling El Bimbo, and Eto Na, Musical Na Po have contributed to OPM's perpetuity. And third is how songwriting competitions and workshops all over the country have effectively expanded song production that is driven by the nature of OPM. But consequently, more specific genre labels such as Philpop, Vispop, Bisrock, or Minpop, to name a few, have become favorably applied. So what is OPM in the 21st century? It carries different meanings across various music and media cultures, but somehow, it tends to function as a music construct for people whose nationhood and identity matter. Hi, I'm Agnes Manalo, and I am the author of Beyond Music and Sound Art. Beyond Music and Sound Art is about four Filipino artists I have had the pleasure of interviewing who have established themselves as the trailblazers, practitioners, and enablers in the realm of sound art in the country. They are Dayang Irayola, Malek Lopez, Tad Ermitano, and Tengal Drilon. They all come from slightly different backgrounds, but had a similarity of intentions coming into the practice of sound. The essay explores the underpinnings of the hows and the whys on the alternative path they all have taken, digressing from the conventions and traditional applications of music and art. As I have come from a background that has strictly followed the learning traditions in music, piano lessons at preschool age, getting a bachelor's and master's degree, taking my postgraduate studies in music, and now ending up as a music production practitioner and an academic. It is a very solid and traditional path that I took, leading up to a relatively predictable outcome, following the systems put in place by our culture and society. But what is interesting to see here is how these four artists were able to carve out their own path, guided by their instinct in their creativity, satisfying their passion for the new and exciting, for the unusual and unconventional, making philosophy as their conceptual approach, a rather personal inquisition, which unknowingly sets up the new directions in their respective communities paving the way for a growing consciousness in response to the current technologies and the environment, a thirst for a new expression towards an evolution of a new art form. Beyond Music and Sound Art tells of the quest for humanity in the arts for these four individuals, of the tales of their successes and failures, on how they were able to surpass all these and turn the tide towards their pioneering efforts in the field of sound art in the Philippines.
In the essay that I wrote, entitled Varieties of Contemporary Filipino Song Mashup, I was basically concerned with orality made by non-formally music school musicians whose music making basically starts not with a piece of paper or notation, but direct encounter of the sound. And then there are many varieties, one type of which is adding lyrics, new lyrics to an existing song. We, we call it contrafacta. Then there's code libet, meaning you create a new song out of an old song. Now, these two mashups, as we call it, happened during that age of vinyl in 19, 1970s to 1980s. Then recently, there have been song medleys that are seen in YouTubes made by musical amateurs. So I, I, I discussed everything, you know, come up with the meaning of this as somehow influenced by technological changes among amateur musicians. And it, it's something very unique because the song mashups that they made like in the past decade is more, it's very influenced by the videoke aesthetics, the sensations that they get from videoke, they add, they layer it with a new thing. So it creates, it's innovation, but in it somehow it's very practical because it exists at the uh, grassroots level. You know, their gadgets are not really high end, but somehow they're able to produce music in a way, democratizing the music production process and also enjoying themselves, you know, being projected on the screen and creating thoughts, you know, their feelings, their, their attachments to those, to things, you know. I suppose mashup, you know, I, I think my essay has expanded the notion of mashup, not just what we know now as song medley, but, you know, it has a larger field, you know, of tinkering around with existing recorded sounds. Thank you. Uh, the title of my presentation is Pinoy's and Battle Rap. And I'll be showing this in a while. And just want to explain why I chose this title. It came as my chapter 5, the last content chapter of my dissertation. And also the reason I, decide, I decided to focus on Pinoy hip-hop in terms of my, the research that I would present as color. In answer to the question, what is the significance of Pinoy hip-hop, more so battle rap, rap, flip top, the poster, the one that I speak about in my essay, what's the significance of this in music discourse? So just allow me to, um, to share my screen. The issues of power, ideology, and the subcultural issues that define my attempt at scholarly inquiry were invariably touched upon. And it is in this ocean of thought that brought the wave crashing shore of realization. If we examine the history of Flip Top, its humble beginnings in a small crowded bar in Makati in February 2010, and then see how this snowballed with the ingenuity of the founder, the Flip Top organization, of posting event videos on YouTube with its click ethos and profit sharing algorithms, it gave me the answer as well. Just looking at that, and I saw that Enigma, the founder, unwittingly gave young Filipinos something to be proud of, and the world a window into which they could view, appreciate, laugh, and cry along with Pinoy MC. Flip Top has become his legacy to the world, which is my main contention in the essay. And while the founder believes that he has this primary, that he does this primarily for the MCs, other hip hop enthusiasts, and a serious hip hop community, what he has not factored in is that this has become an embrace. This has been embraced worldwide, not just here in the Philippines, but all around the world, not just by Filipinos, making it the most watched battle rap league in the world. So what Eric has created in Flip Top is his, like I said, a legacy to the world. It's a 21st century digital era that has conspired with his and others, like the other MCs, has conspired with his vision of uh, music that is artistic and worthy of. So allow me to share this two and a half minute video to end my presentation. It's a montage. Nasa top five ako na mga nasa top five nyo! <laughs> O ang pupurga sa mga bulatay tulad mo dito sa liga na parang kombantrin. Yang estilo mong unorthodox, hindi lang pambobo, pang-abnormal din. <laughs> da 
Dahil pagdating sa tula ang hindi magtugma ang pinakamalala at ang mortal sin. Alam ko yan dahil kaya kong tawirin ng underground at mainstream na parang langit at lupa ako si Constantine. Namsa! Papapapapapampam ka! Tatatatatatatatatatanga! Itong kakakakakakakaba ay dadapa na lang dyan bigla pagtugtog ng bumbong pakchak bugbog tong hudlong natang na bukbog lalo ko ka magluklok ka na lang damsa! Sa grappler ng rap Mapamayto na mabagal Mabilis malalim sa battle o kanta Alam kong dalalapit sa mga tulad mo Ang mental hindi din ito Di matutuldo ka ng mga multi mo Ang pagiging multitasker ko na rapper Dahil multi-talented ako Nagpunta ako sa Indang 13 Yung mga halaman malalago Sa kakaisip ko sa mukha mo Lumabas yung kakambal mo Sabi niya, tok Yung sinabi mong huli Gusto ko lang masita Kakambal ko, tok ko Kakambal pala kita Buntis ako Nine months lang mabuntis, nine years na yan. We're only doing this for fun. Ako yung six threat na sa sabing paano ka masasal ba ng wordplay? May bilang ang kalaban mo. Sabayan, sabayan, sabayan na abakan mga yawang hanggang sa mga yawang kalaban. It's your host tonight, Mo. We got a battle for the Filipino conference. U.S. conference battle. 90 seconds of Brody J. Flat up, magigay para sa parating na ako. Because the league is for is for rappers. It's it's for people who really live and breathe this shit and who really want to make something out of themselves to be able to represent their slice of life whether it's through battles or through performances so uh, hello and mabuhay my name is Tusa Montes and the article that i contributed for this issue is um entitled Music Festivals in the Philippines, Tropicality, Identity, and Cosmopolitanism. So, uh, well, music festivals are exciting musical phenomena in the country, and there are various kinds of festivals. Um, so there are jazz festivals, and then there are indie festivals. But for this article, I'm focusing on contemporary transnational festivals that are initiated by non-governmental organizations that have significant participation and support from expatriates and local government units. Um, and the, these music festivals, um, they allow us to take a peek into the local music scene. And they are also cultural, tourist, and aesthetic experiences. So the important thing about these festivals is the experience, not just listening, but being there, watching. It's really a feast for the senses. Uh, tasting the food that is available, uh, taking in the environment, the sights and the sounds. And for this article, my focus is on three music festivals because I believe they provide insight as well into the music festival industry. The first is Fête de la Musique, which is a festival that started in France and found its way here. And it has become localized and became a massive festival. Um, as of 2019, it celebrated its 25th year here, and this is usually held in Manila. The second festival is the Malasimbo Festival, named after Mount Malasimbo in Puerto Galera in Mindoro. And the third is the Brazilipinas Festival, which is a cultural festival highlighting both Brazilian and Filipino music culture. So I argue that these festivals are locally and globally, both locally and globally, culturally relevant and meaningful and they have been around long enough to influence the Philippine music landscape. They also attract foreigners. And I think the goal for these festivals is to be able to give, to, to be able to give the opportunity for the foreigners to travel and to enjoy local music. So I examined their impact on the Philippine music scene as tropicalized, conceptually meaning conceptually rendered local and cosmopolitan representations of Philippine culture. And in other words, I'm looking at these music festivals. They are a lens into the tropicality and cosmopolitanism that we see in Filipino culture. Because tropicality is not just physical space. And through these festivals, we're trying to explore that 
tropicality is a conventionally perceived cultural trait of the Filipino. And with the festivals, tropicality is heightened. So I present in this article how they are interesting musical phenomena that provide a broader perspective of the local music scene. And I'm sharing also my experiences as a participant in the, these festivals, either as an audience or a performer. And because I've been to these festivals more than once. And looking at it now, 2020, we are confined in our own little corners and how this is the opposite of the festivals where these are about large social gatherings. And it feels like uh, reflecting, re reflecting on it now, it feels like this is looking into a different kind of past. But hopefully when this pandemic is over, we are able to gather again and participate and celebrate music festivals such as the ones that I wrote about in this article. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Desiree Peralejo and I wrote Powerful Move, the Influence of the Budot's Dance in Philippine Society. The paper investigates how the kitsch dance named Budot's reflects Filipino culture and society. It answers the question, why is the Budots popular among the Filipino masses? And what does the Budots represent or mean to them? Dance and music can act as a form of representation of one's culture. It can act as a reflection and a mirror to everyday life. The paper highlights how the Budots dance was used as a political campaign tool, as well as an inspiration to a choreographic art piece. Interestingly, Budots as a campaign tool and Budots as an art form reflected three Filipino mentalities, namely Pakikisama, Pakikipagkapwa, and Bahala na si Bathala. According to Virgilio Enriquez, Pakikipagkapwa means shared identity. Pakikisama is companionship. And Bahala na si Bathala in this context means to bring all worries and problems up to a higher being. The Budots used as a campaign tool, depended on these three Filipino mentalities to gain trust and confidence to Filipino mass voters. Likewise, these three Filipino mentalities were the source of inspiration and realization of a young choreographer. These three Filipino mentalities of Pakikipagkapwa, Pakikisama, and Bahala na si Bathala echoed and reflected in both Budots as a campaign tool and Budots as an art form. Through the Budots dance, we can visualize and feel some of the pressing conditions of the Philippine society. Discussion of the music section. Since most of us are music teachers, so uh, I'm just challenging you. Um, you know, how can our researches improve the content of our teaching music at the uh, tertiary education. I don't know, will you be able to? Um, Des, you have something to okay. say, Des? <laughs> Can I go ahead? Because I'm not really teaching music, but I'm teaching dance. And it is related to music. And it's so important as well for my students or our students uh, who, who, who are dance majors and music majors to understand the surrounding because I do teach dance in society. So my paper is very important and relevant in, in their current um, studies to be able to see the situation around them and to apply that to their own um, creations, their choreographies, how it has affected their, their um, composition, their improvisation, and how they can actually uh, bring out what they feel and what their thoughts um, through not only through music but through movement and music but because they have related for example for Earl Sorilia he has used um, the popular Budots music uh, together with what was being performed as the Budots dance and combined that and created that, he used that, and then he created his own budots. And now he has developed the, the meaning in which, which was reflected to his um, choreography. 
I hope I answered that question because for yeah. for me it's yeah it's not just for music. In, indeed, there's a shared there is a shared passion, you know, to contextualize art forms. So I think. I think this. Uh, I think that's really a very good direction to teach the, the context, the cultural context, you know, of why, of why art forms are like that. They're really embedded in life worlds. I wonder how this can apply to other music programs because it seems to me like many of us are teaching in different types of programs. One in Ateneo, another one in Benil. Uh, then we have one in College of Music, which is so conservatory-centric. <laughs> so I don't know if, if you can respond to that, you know, uh, putting in new content into uh, the courses that we teach. So college teachers, please help me <laughs> discuss these things. <laughs> yeah, I'll go first. I yeah, know I have something to say then. Um, in, in my field, well, um, I don't know what field I am actually in Ateneo, but I'm trying to carve a way that my research or this this um, music, our music, our passion for music, our academic discourse about music, perhaps can be contextualized within cultural studies. In the School of Social Sciences, there's anthropology, and then now in development studies, the way perhaps that's, that's challenging me as a, as a teacher now in development studies is to bring not so much the... Not so much the MCs themselves, but the frameworks that helped me understand uh, the scene that I was into. And then it can also help the students perhaps also be aware of you know, sub subaltern, subcultural, the, the other voiceless, that sort of thing, which I think uh, at least I'm comfortable doing. And should there be any interest shown about, let's say, how specific popular music can can be brought to the fore, then I think I'm in a position to help with with your help also. But that's how I, that's how it would be at Ateneo because we don't have a music program, and so it comes in. It appears to come in as a scaffold to all these other programs, and but I uh, I argue that it can be more central in the curriculum. So baby steps. Thank you. From other schools, uh, Agnes, Adji. <laughs> uh, yes, um, in our program at the De La Salle College of St. Benil, um, which I, I helped develop, uh, we did not center on a specific genre. For Unlike uh, in the conservatory that you, you are actually geared towards the study of music, the traditional way. No? So we did not center on a specific genre because we are aware that it is the technology that pushes, uh, that drives the directions to, to where the create, their creativity would take them. So the, the essays that, that are featured sort of validates the existence of, um, of an identity. And hopefully the college students in the tertiary education would be able to read it and sort of identify themselves with the proponents of of the characters that are at uh, at the forefront of these movements, and that would give them a sense of belongingness or a sense of community that would give uh, drive further the the scene, whereas it could be in the music realm or into the sound aspect of it, or furthermore, developing a new art form. Well, it, uh, in my essay, I did not specify uh, a definite art form because everything seems to be fluid. The interviewees um, did not want to define a, a, a word. Even the concept of sound art, they have been very, they did not want to pinpoint it as sound art. And, no real definition really came out of, of our talks. But we were in an understanding, a general understanding that we were talking at the same plane. I think uh, it is very uh, important in, in a community, in a society, to be able to communicate, uh, even if you're not communicating with the same 
vocabulary, but if you have the same feeling and the same intention, I think that's enough. So hopefully, uh, all these essays would um, give our students, uh, the, fu the future leaders in our society, culturally, no? hope that would give them a push into the right direction or path. Thank you. So I guess, you know, all these, the essays that we wrote will become a tool for broadening the horizon for understanding things, you know, because they realize if we emphasize the cultural context, I mean, why a particular expression is like that, then, you know, one broadens, as uh, Dr. Mendoza, Dr. Lara has been saying that it gives them a, a frame, you know, to to understand a scene, you know, but we're looking into many, many scenes, you know, then uh, we begin to appreciate a really uh, a, a more humanistic approach to understanding things. And it, it gives empathy, you know, to understand. It frames how we should respond to, to others, you know. I wonder if there are more ideas that we can, we can discuss. By the way, this is not a PhD seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so nervous <laughs> so Susa, since you're teaching philippine music i think i think your article is is i think your article is very interesting you know because what what has been thought of festival is just the folkloric festival and the many festivals initiated by the lgus and they keep on dancing those reified you know as if expressions are frozen in time you know like tinikling for instance <laughs> <laughs> Here we go beyond that, you know, uh, we go into a more dynamic festival, you know, afforded by travel, the, the promotion of local cultures, you know, it's dynamic really. So, um, so tell me how you integrate this in your class, Tusa. Wow, um, tough question to be honest, sir, but um, I would say... Um, well, definitely, if, if there's one way to encourage the students to go out there and experience the festival by attending, by watching, that's definitely a legitimate form of musicology fieldwork. I think that should count as a, as a field, a worthy field of study where one can observe and, you know, take down notes. And because I believe that when you're in a festival, you get to witness different kinds of music, different kinds of musicians, um, many kinds of genres, okay? Uh, mostly popular genres, but they're all there. Jazz, world music, hip hop. And it's really exciting in the sense that you're, you get to be exposed to music that's beyond what you see on radio and TV. And you'd see that there is really a dynamic music scene out there. There's so much about Philippine popular music culture, Philippine music culture for that matter, that has yet to be explored. So I think for me, if the student can actually go to these festivals, it's a very, it's going to be a very educational experience in itself. And then perhaps, you know, provide some form of processing and discussion in the classroom afterward. But as I mentioned earlier, um, now that we are in um, quarantine season, some of these festivals have begun to put uh, to create digital versions of these. So I guess the good thing about that is now there are pe people have more access, you know, in, in the virtual world just by uh, logging into maybe Facebook Live or a website. People can so, like Fête de la Musique last June. There was a digital edition, and now and people were able to watch uh, and be in the festival just through the comfort of their homes. And this is something that i would say we can still try to understand you know how these festivals are now transitioning into the virtual world you know because of circumstances i believe there is also the upcoming ccp jazz festival and they're doing dig a digital edition of it and i think ma'am krina is also going to be performing in that one so i'm curious personally how it's all going to be and somehow we're transporting this tropicality and cosmopolitanism in the virtual world through the festivals so i think that's my answer <laughs> sir yeah thank you you know <laughs> this notion of popular culture being a democratizing uh, uh, expression of sorts you know uh, festivals partic it's participative so i wonder if we can emphasize this in in our classrooms but then i wish to ask 
Professor Kayabiab about popular the OPM especially. I mean, how how is this democratic impulse, you know, becoming more pronounced, you know, in this age of interconnectedness, you know? Krina, do you have thoughts on the OPM being a tool for that democratic democratizing impulse, you know, because many people can participate. I mean, I can speak for my the grassroots culture, you know, doing all the song medleys. And it's really interesting, you know, those little people, you know, gaining presence, becoming more visible through the media, uh, social media. But I guess even now, uh, I think the, ma- the professional musicians, and that's what OPM is about, you know, OPM mm-hmm. is really a production of the professional musicians, you know, they're all, main, you call it mainstream indie, you know, it's, it's, it's strange because we thought that indie are separate from the mainstream, but now it's really the independent music makers who are gaining ground, you know, so more participation from them. So, Krina, can you yeah. uh, respond to this question? Yeah, uh, I think when it comes to uh, OPM, it's, it's a very powerful label to begin with that began in the 70s and right now in the 21st century there have been a lot of you know dialogue and arguments and papers coming out uh, trying to figure out and trying to contextualize what really OPM is nowadays Do, doing in doing this in the classroom it helps the students be more critical about how to to historiograph let's say the meaning of OPM throughout time and it doesn't have to follow approaches such as the you know the decline and the maturity of of the idea of OPM throughout the decades um, OPM can be talked about in terms of its processes in music scenes in recording in live music scenes and nowadays in online in the online platform with what we're experiencing so for example the cultural policies and the industry policies are changing as we are speaking now and um, now nowadays they're more strict in terms of you know collecting for example for for the usage of older songs and so all these are you know interconnected as you've mentioned um, uh, Doc Jojo, and in this way, also we understand how the idea of OPM uh, should not really just sit on the idea of the mainstream. So OPM actually encompasses different areas of popular music studies, and so I hope this paper kind of provides a new framework or or an approach of how to historiograph. Um, scenes from popular music studies. Oh, thank you. Basically, we've, uh, we've discussed this issue on how to use the material we wrote for our for teaching purposes and then we go into this notion of the popular being uh, it's a different impulse, you know, uh, it's more democratizing because it invites people to participate in the processes, the cultural processes, the producing of music and circulating it and consuming it, you know, it's no longer just really one way, but more two way processes. Concluding message from the section editor. You know, I think we created some kind of a treasure because there's no publication that has this diversity, uh, that has this treatment of diverse music, you know, and the message is really to be more inclusive in our thoughts and with more inclusivity, we have a healthy society. So please read our our researches, especially this one, because it is a good teaching material. Thank you. This has been the virtual book launching of Art Archive 3 featuring music. Please like and subscribe our YouTube channel as well as our Vimeo account. To download our collection, visit us on our official website. Thank you very much.